Hello, my name is Jeremy Swem. I'm senior pastor at our Savior Lutheran Church and School, and this is episode 23 of a Bible study on the Gospel of Matthew. As we go into this week's session, we're going to be looking at chapter 20, uh, paying special note about how chapter 19 connects to chapter 20, and then looking ahead to the final week of Jesus' work in the city of Jerusalem. As always, if you have any questions, you can send them to me via email at jswem at oursavior-gr.org, or please uh, leave a comment on our Facebook page, and we'll answer it in the next episode. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you've caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that, by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we move into chapter 20, just uh, keep in mind that at the end of chapter 19, we heard about this rich young man who came to Jesus asking, uh, what, what can I do about eternal life? Uh, the precise words, teacher, what, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And in the end, uh, the eternal life is something that is, is given, not earned. Uh, unless you're talking about the work of Christ. Christ uh, does all of the work that's necessary for us, fulfilling God's law, so that we should have eternal life. Uh, later in that same section of the gospel, then Peter begins asking some questions because he and the other disciples heard that it's very difficult for a rich man to go into heaven. And then after that... Uh, Jesus notes that uh, it, it, salvation is only possible with God himself. And then Peter, in reply to that, says, See, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? So again, there's that connection to the rich young man asking, kind of, what deed must I do? Now, Peter says, look at all the good deeds we've done. Now what? And so... At the end of that, Jesus talks about how we inherit eternal life and then follows that with many who are last first will be last and the last first. <laughs> Which uh, my children love quoting to each other. Not necessarily in the right context, uh, but sometimes if one of them gets, gets to go first, well, then uh, one of the younger ones will say, well, the last will be, or the first will be last. Uh, but that, that's it in relationship to our, our parable that we hear at the start of chapter 20. Uh, that, that line ends up being used twice. So, diving into the parable in chapter 20. Jesus told them a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with his laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Jesus begins teaching about this matter of the last first and the first last uh, with a parable wherein uh, it's very clear that the master is, is God himself. And isn't it interesting that this, this master is so interested in working with his people, being involved in uh, directly with them. Um, not having somebody else go into the marketplace, but instead heading to the marketplace himself to seek out workers, to call them. And you, you have then the, kind of that, that uh, calling word in mind, especially by studying the third article, the Apostles' Creed, from the Catechism, the Luther's explanation of it. 
I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. He's enlightened me with his gifts. He's sanctified and kept me in the true faith. And so God calls. God calls through the work of his Holy Spirit. In this case, the the master of the house, the, the one who owns this vineyard, the one who's very wealthy and has tons of servants probably who could do his bidding, he goes out into the marketplace himself to hire them. So he's, he's gracious and merciful and desires to be involved in the lives of his workers. Or in our case, this God wants to be involved in the lives of his creation, the, his, his creatures. Um, from there, uh, we note that the, the laborers, us, that, uh, that God has agreed to, to give us something for our work. Uh, that's not eternal life, but certainly all sorts of blessings, <laughs> the confidence of salvation. Uh, but that's not a result of our works. Instead, that's simply what he gives us. Uh, the present day work uh, as faithful uh, men and women of God is serving within our vocations. Uh, going and then, then seeing to the needs of our children, our parents, our neighbors, uh, whether that be on our street or in our community, um, we could even extend that into the world itself, right? Uh, our neighbors have a need to hear the gospel, whether those happen to be the neighbors who uh, are up the street from us uh, or our, our brothers and sisters in, in far and distant lands. Uh, thanks be to God that we have many missionaries out in the field and they're preaching the gospel and also seeing to the needs, the physical needs of our, our brothers and sisters um, and those who should be welcomed into the kingdom. But moving on into verse 3. Going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. But notice that the, the master isn't willing to go out once. He's going to keep going over and over and over again into the marketplace to keep bringing people in. That's, that's the work of a very merciful and gracious and loving God. One call is not enough. He's going to keep going out there and bringing them in. It's interesting to note that a specific wage is not presented at this point. Instead, for those third hour workers, they agree on whatever is a dikaion. So whatever is right, whatever is just, whatever, not fair. Okay, but, but uh, it has to do with, with righteousness and justice. Now, what's interesting is that the, the righteous and just God, instead of giving them what's right and just, chooses to give them something else. We'll hear about that in a little bit. Regardless, the workers decide that this is a good deal and they go out from the marketplace into the vineyard. So they went, going, at, uh, going out again, about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. He keeps going. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. He said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? He doesn't have to do that, by the way. This is, this is the, the end of the day. Uh, what other work could they really accomplish at the very end? Now, who would be left, these 11th hour workers? Where were they when he went out at the first part of the day, or the third hour, or the sixth hour, or the ninth hour? Now it's the 11th hour. Are these the, the final ones who really can't do any work? Uh, the lame, the crippled, the blind, the deaf? Perhaps. Uh, were they trying to shirk their responsibilities earlier? <laughs> Maybe. Did nobody else really want them because they're not good workers? We don't know in the end. Uh, many of those things are possible. What we do know and what we can focus on is the work of the master. He doesn't care what quality work they may have done in the past. He doesn't care about their present condition. What he cares about, about is calling and giving. And so he calls them in. You go to the vineyard 
too, he says. For if no one else has hired you, I will. This is the gracious work of our God. Perhaps the comparison would be when when you had at some point to, to pick out a, a team from your class for a game like kickball. I always hated that. I didn't like being the team captain, uh, nor did I like being picked because it seemed to always say something about you as either a leader or as a player. Uh, as far as a leader, are you picking to win? Or are you picking your friends? Or are you picking the people who you feel don't usually get picked because you want to give them some encouragement? There are so many options, right? Are you picking based on the dynamics of your team? You want them to be able to work together? There's another option. But uh, getting to the point of the, the person who's picked, right? Uh, that, that either builds up your ego and your self-esteem or it really drops it down, doesn't it? It can destroy it when you're the last person standing there and neither of the two people who happen to be picking want you. And I hear that in these words of these 11th hour workers. Nobody hired us. Nobody wanted us. These are the unwanted ones unwanted by the world for whatever reason. Uh, maybe it's because of their work ethic. Maybe it's because of their belief. Maybe it's because of the shape of their body. We don't know. But the Master wants them. And so also the Lord wants us. He desires us. He wants to call us in, regardless of what our past lives happened to be like. He wants to call us, regardless of what sins we've committed, regardless of where we happen to be right now in life, whether we seem to have it all together, whether our life's a mess, right? Whether we're, we're like that skier on the slopes who uh, really skis right through the moguls with no problems, or whether we're, we're the guy who's fallen over and, and has the, the yard sale because all of his equipment is just everywhere on the hill. <laughs> uh, the Lord desires to call us and he, he's unconcerned about the state our life, life happens to be. He's more concerned about our eternal state. And so he calls. He brings us in. What a beautiful thing that is. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And... When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now that is absolutely remarkable. It's it's not the the correct business plan for the CEO running a Fortune 500 company. You can't give to those uh, who have only worked an hour the same wages that you give the the. Uh, salaried worker who's just put in 80. Uh, that won't work as far as a business model. You'll be losing money, tons and tons of money. And so this is not advice on how to run a business, nor is this a matter of justice. Instead, this is the gracious and abundant giving of our Lord and how he loves to give. We who deserve nothing but punishment instead are given, well, all sorts of things, right? Uh, this body and life and all that's needed to support it, as we talk about in the first article of the Apostles' Creed, uh, as we pray about in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, knowing that God gives us uh, uh, clothing and food, shoes and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals. He gives us all of this. And then he keeps giving because he gives to us his very Son, Christ's holy, precious blood, his innocent suffering and death. Our God is a gracious giver. And so if we expect that it's our work that is going to uh, help us to gain access into heaven, if we think that it is uh, some type of good deed to be performed, that we may have eternal life, then we are deceived. The truth is not in us. We, in fact, would be in a dangerous spot. Instead, uh, God just gives. 
Now this does cause some consternation, <laughs> no doubt about it. When those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. Well, why did they think they would receive more? Because they're standing uh, at the end of the line and they know uh, what's going on in front of them. They've heard it. It's like the, the child who comes into the kitchen and there you've uh, poured out three glasses of orange juice and they're, they're meticulously watching to make sure that everybody uh, who's, who's done the same amount of work gets the same amount of juice. Maybe they even take out a ruler and measure, right? And so these men know that they've they've agreed on a denarius a day. They know the workers who came in later. Uh, they know what they look like. And they also know what they've gotten paid. And so the result, if we worked more, we're going to get paid more. That is the way of the world. That is the way things run. Or at least... That's the way we think they should run. Get paid based on your, your merit and your work, not based on somebody else's merit and work. That's why many of us don't like group projects, because the group receives a grade regardless of how hard anybody in the group worked. We should all, in fact, want to work hard. <laughs> but our human flesh, our sinful flesh, our corrupted flesh gets in the way so often. So, back to these fellows. Uh, they thought they'd get more, but each of them also received a denarius. Now, that technically is what is just and right. That's the requirement by the contract. This is what they signed up for. This is what they agreed to. It's a verbal agreement, no doubt about that. This is what they agreed to with the master in the marketplace. Work a day, get a denarius. But, but, when they look around and see what the master has done, they want to say, and they do in fact say, essentially, this is not fair. On receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, hour and you've made uh, us, them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day, and the scorching heat. So they, they come in identifying what happens to be inequitable, what happens to be unfair. And they're trying then to get the master to give them more. The master does respond. He replied to them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Notice what he does. He goes back to the contract, the agreement that they had. This is what you said you'd do. This is what I've given to you. It's not a matter of being unfair. Notice what happens next. Take what belongs to you and go. Get along. Move it. I chose to give these last hour workers that I chose to give uh, to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. God is just. Yet God is also gracious and merciful. We don't receive the wages that we deserve, for the wages of sin is death. Or in the case of earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, hypocrites get their wages. That means they get the applause or, or perhaps they sway the opinion of men. But this doesn't do anything for them eternally. If we expect God to be just, then we will find him exactly as he is, a God of justice focused on the Ten Commandments. But our God desires to be embraced, held fast to, by mercy and grace. And this is certainly what Jesus is teaching on here, that he is the gracious and merciful one, showing mercy where it is undeserved, giving grace instead of giving, giving to us 
what we have earned because of our sin. The good God chooses to give in abundance. He is gracious. And yet when we look at him, we look at him through an eye that happens to be corrupted. And that is one of the things that pops out here in the Greek. Ho uh, ophthalmos su poneros estin. The translation of this is is fine. We hear it as, um, a, let's see. Oh, there we go. We hear it as, uh, why do you begrudge my generosity? But in, in fact, it is, uh, is the eye of yours evil? that it doesn't see me as being good. When our eye is corrupted and we look to God and his grace and mercy and we see that he is giving that grace and mercy to sinners, uh, much like the, the Pharisees looking on the tax collectors and prostitutes gathering around Jesus, uh, we judge. We judge God. We judge those people. Instead of seeing God being gracious and merciful and calling all sorts of sinners to repentance and into his kingdom. So well, when our eye is evil and we look at these people, we say, well, that, that's not right. That person shouldn't be called a Christian. I know what they have been talking about behind my back. I know what they've posted on Facebook. I know their browser history. I know all sorts of dirt about that person. They don't deserve that grace and mercy. And yet, none of us do. When we begin to judge God, saying, well, that person doesn't deserve grace and mercy, that doesn't, person doesn't deserve forgiveness, well, then our eyes, in fact, seeing God through the sinful lens, uh, that kind of this, this corruption of our, our minds and our hearts, which doesn't see God as he is, the gracious and good giver. And so then, <laughs> oh, we need to repent and we need our eyes to be cleansed, just like our hearts are cleansed, so that we can see God in his mercy giving to those hypocrites, those sinners, uh, those, those people over there, uh, exactly what he's also giving to us hypocrites, us sinners, us people over here. Now, Jesus continues to go on with his disciples, and, and for the third time, he talks explicitly about his death and resurrection. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and he will be judged, uh, condemned to death. And they will hand him over to the Gentiles in order to be mocked uh, uh, and, and beaten uh, or flogged and to be crucified. And the third day he will rise. So this of all the passion predictions is the most specific. It's the most detailed. And Jesus then is leading us from he who is Jesus, who is the first, who will be treated as the last. Jesus, the, the perfect son of God, the holy one, is going to be treated as the greatest of criminals. It's only in this third passion prediction that you finally hear what type of death the son of man is to die, death by crucifixion. Instead, before we heard in chapter 16 about the divine necessity of Jesus' death, we also heard about betrayal and him being handed over to sinners. But now, finally, we hear that Jesus is going to be crucified. In all three passion predictions, the thing that is the same is the resurrection. So clear, so comforting. Jesus will be raised on the third day. As a result of this conversation, as a result perhaps of Jesus once again pointing to his 
death and resurrection, uh, the disciples begin talking about far less weighty things. They want to talk about first ones and last ones. <laughs> and so the, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, uh, most likely Salome, right? And the sons of Zebedee being James and John, came up to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. Now, this is rather interesting. Uh, pretty exciting, in fact, because most of the time the disciples are seem to be uncomfortable with asking Jesus for things. But here, this mother of James and John is very willing to come up and ask. Uh, she's rather bold, in fact, in her question. Jesus said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. So when she asks this, she's asking that her boys will be placed in the positions of prominence in the kingdom. Now, is this the temporal kingdom that some people mistakenly account to Jesus? Uh, for instance, Pilate, when he talks about, are you a king? Uh, because that's what they're saying of you. And Jesus then notes, well, if I were really a king, wouldn't I have an army trying to break me out of your headquarters right now? Fighting against the Pharisees, or well before this, ensuring that I'm not captured on the Mount of Olives. But th this is uh, one of the ideas that the, is relatively common at the time of Christ, that the Messiah will come and establish uh, a temporal kingdom. And so, can, can my boys have the positions of favor? One at your right hand, one at your left. Kind of like when David was king, he had uh, his mother Bathsheba uh, close to him, next to him. Jesus goes on to answer not Salome, but his answer is directed at James and John. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. In this case, the disciples and Jesus are talking past one another. They don't understand what the figure of speech Jesus happens to be using here, the, the cup that he's referring to. This is no ordinary cup. This is the cup of God's wrath, the cup that is brought up again later in the Gospel of Matthew as Jesus prays that the cup would be removed from him. Thereafter, Jesus then says, But Father, not my will, but yours be done. And so this cup is the cup of wrath and the cup of suffering. The disciples don't understand this yet. They don't see it clearly. And so they boldly assert, We are able to drink whatever that cup may be. So we, we take a little pity on the disciples because we've all misunderstood other people. Uh, we've said things boldly or callously or things that are inappropriate. Um, and, and Lord, guard the door of my lips, right? Uh, so that we don't say these foolish things, so that we don't say these impulsive things. And Jesus responds then to them. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand, and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it's been prepared by my Father. So it is that James and John, and really all Christians, will partake in the sufferings of Christ. We have these in common. And in fact, Christ partakes in our sufferings. He bears all of our sins in his body on the cross. He suffers and dies for us. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4 notes that we are partakers of Christ's suffering. Paul notes that we bear in our bodies the marks of Christ. James and John and many Christians, all Christians really, will suffer. In the case of James, he suffers as a martyr, being killed for confessing the faith. Check Acts chapter 12. John survives into old age. But he too, along with the rest of the disciples, is uh, 
he, he's, he's persecuted for confessing the faith. From Acts chapter 5, it's noted that there John is imprisoned, he's scourged, he's ridiculed, and the disciples count all of these things as blessings. Well, how can that be? Well, it, it's certain that we don't suffer alone. Christ suffers along with us. And this suffering is, in fact, suffering for the sake of the gospel. And Jesus has already noted the, the blessings that come along with that and the certainty that it will happen. The blessings, chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew, the certainty that we will face suffering, Matthew chapter 10. <clears throat> so James and John will partake in the cup of suffering, but not the cup of God's wrath. Instead, Christ drains that to the dregs for us, endures all of the punishment for us. When the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. We're not necessarily sure that this happens immediately after, but it would make some sense that they're all in Jesus' presence and they hear what's going on. They're a little bit shocked that the mother of James and John ask this and then that they would be so bold as to say oh yeah we'll we'll drink the cup um, or as Peter would note later even if I must die for you I will not deny you and so they're right they're a little bit upset a lot bit upset they're indignant because of what's just happened Jesus then redirects all of the disciples he calls to them and said to them, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever must, would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The great ones of this world place themselves in high places. Uh, they even place themselves upon the backs of those who are least. Not so Jesus. He doesn't exalt himself at the expense of humanity. He certainly could simply be exalted. He is true God, but that is not why he has come. He's not come to have all humanity come and serve him or praise him. Instead, he's come to serve us and to give his life as a ransom for many. When we hear uh, Lutron Pallone, uh, the ransoming language, uh, the buying back language of us, the offering of some type of sacrifice for humanity, uh, we're taken back to the Old Testament and what must be done because of sin but then when we hear for many, it makes us wonder, is, is this then the, sa the sacrifice of Christ, is it for many or is it for all? Remember that there are some other passages which help us to understand this. Uh, for example, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, uh, John the Baptist directs his disciples to Jesus. He says, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, the cosmos. John 3, for God so loved the cosmos, the world. So this Lutron is not just for a certain number. It's for all. Christ comes to offer his haima, his blood, his psuche, his, his life for all. And this, this work of Christ, then, his pouring forth of his holy, precious blood, his giving of his innocent suffering and death, is so that all men would be saved. All of humanity, men, women, children, from Adam and Eve to the last day of this earth and the last one who is born, Christ desires 
all would come to a knowledge of salvation, that his work would apply to everyone. And of course, his work, uh, be, because it is the shedding of his holy precious blood, the precious blood of Christ, the God-man, uh, that is sufficient. But if there's no faith, then there's no benefit of that. Now, we move on to a, a few people who have faith. In fact, it is these blind men sitting by the road. As they went out of Jericho. So Jesus said his disciples had been traveling towards Jerusalem. Uh, elsewhere we've heard how Jesus' face, uh, not in Matthew but in Luke, his face is set like flint towards Jerusalem. He's going to accomplish his mission. The time is now. And so they've been journeying up to Jerusalem right now. They're passing through Jericho. They go into Jericho. They come out of Jericho. A great crowd followed him. Now, it, Mark notes that this happens as Jesus is going into Jericho. Uh, one is left to wonder then, uh, are the, the gospel writers mistaken? Luke is helpful here because he notes that it was on the road to Jericho that that fellow Zacchaeus was waiting, looking for Jesus. And as Jesus was coming out of Jericho, Zacchaeus sees him, uh, asks him to come into his house, and they are then going back, back to Jericho, to Zacchaeus' house. When the blind men sitting by the road heard that Jesus was passing by, and they cried out, Lord, uh, Kurie, son of David, Chuyas David, have mercy on us. The Greek notes that the very first word is actually eleison, have mercy. Chemas, <laughs> on us. Mercy us, God. Oh, doesn't that beautifully tie in what we already heard at the start of this chapter? How the master is in fact merciful and gracious, not giving workers what they deserve. Isn't it also beautiful how that's tying back into the work of Christ dying upon the cross for humanity? He who did not come to be served, but to serve us up his life, an act of grace, an act of mercy. These blind men, even though they can't see, they can see that the Lord is gracious. He is merciful. He will hear their prayer for mercy and give them exactly what they need. They also confess him to be the Messiah, the son of David. This title, which Jesus really hasn't allowed to get out before this point, is finally going to be proclaimed here and as he rides into Jerusalem. On that Palm Sunday, the people will be gathered around saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. The time has finally come for Jesus to go forth to suffer and die as the son of David, the son of God. So these blind men are revealing something of profound importance. Here comes Messiah for us. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more. Eleison, Chemas, Kurie. Have mercy on us, Lord. Quias David, son of David. So though the crowd tries to silence their prayer, these blind men continue praying. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So also, if someday the, the world, the crowd, tries to silence us, we'll keep on praying. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord hears their prayers. Jesus stops. He calls to them. He says to them, What do you desire I do to you? And they said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, splagniste, inwardly moved. 
um, translated here as pitied. He touches the eyes of theirs, and immediately they regained their sight. They recovered their sight. They saw again and followed him. Jesus' act of mercy will not be limited to these two blind men on the roadside. His great act of mercy is the one which is about to be accomplished in Jerusalem. As he suffers, as he's taken, falsely accused and convicted, as he's handed over to the Gentiles, where they take him, they mock him, they flog him, and crucify him. And on the third day he rises, so that we, who have all of this sin and death well we can have confidence that Jesus has taken that into himself paid all that is necessary suffered the wrath of God offered himself as atonement become the propitiatory sacrifice for us his rising from the dead proclaims our justification we are righteous in him and on the last day, he will restore our bodies, taking them, making them imperishable, incorruptible. Just as his body has risen from the dead, so we shall rise bodily from the dead. Thanks be to God. Well, as we wrap up the 23rd Bible study here, uh, we're greatly looking forward to a few things coming up in the, the next six to eight weeks, I suppose. First, in May, we're going to have a visitor from the Siberian Seminary. Um, one of the professors will be coming here to do a presentation on the, the, the Lutheran Seminary in Siberia. And the work that they're doing and also how Christianity has fared uh, within uh, communist Russia and post-communist Russia. And then in the month of June we'll resume in-person Bible study. June 13th we'll be back here at the school uh, doing Bible study again together um, and looking forward to that so much. I really look forward to the interaction that we'll have uh, and our time studying the scriptures. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you sent forth your Son to be the ransom for many, to offer up his life for us. We also thank you that your Jesus, who has risen from the dead, assures us that we too shall rise from the dead. Heavenly Father, please bring us to repentance so that we would not always seek to be the first, but instead that we would seek to be like Christ amongst the least, serving those around us. Especially give us forgiveness for all of the times when we have uh, thought that we can do it ourselves, <laughs> that we can earn our salvation. Uh, or that we're more important than all the other people around us. Uh, you see us as, as your beloved gifts, your precious, uh, precious creation. So also let us see one another as you see us. Especially give us eyes that would, would see your forgiveness at work, would see one another as sinners who have been cleansed and thus are your your beloved saints. Finally, continue to strengthen us in the faith that we may hold fast to Christ's work. And finally, on the last day when we are raised from the dead, enter with joy, both body and soul united together into the eternal kingdom. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always.